In the hands of director José Padilla, current events go from nightly news stories to fast-paced action thrillers. His vision of institutionalized police corruption in 2007's Elite Squad won the Brazilian director a golden bear at the Berlin Film Festival. And Narcos, the saga of Colombia's most notorious drug baron, Pablo Escobar, has been a hit for Netflix. Mixing documentary and drama, Padilla's latest release revisits a historic hostage situation in Entebbe, Uganda, an incident which was to be decisive for the future of the Middle East. Anyone who tries to resist me will be shot. José Padilla, thanks so much for joining us. Your latest film, Seven Days in Entebbe, tells the story of when, in 1976, a flight was hijacked between Tel Aviv and Paris by Palestinian militants and East German sympathizers, and those on board were held hostage in Entebbe, Uganda, as Israeli authorities decided how to respond. It's not the first time this film has been made. I think the events have been relayed four times before. What did you want to bring to your version of the story? All those uh, movies are, are interesting on their own uh, way. Most of them uh, tell the story of a military operation. We are looking at the relationship between the hijackers and the hostages on one hand. And then we are also looking at the relationship between uh, Shimon Peres and Isaac Rabin as they debated what to do with the crisis. So it's, it's, we are looking at other aspects uh, of what happened. Also, those movies were done right after. So there wasn't time for research. Our movie um, is based on a book of a, a British scholar, Professor Saul Davis, who did uh, extensive research for many years. It tells a story that's slightly different from the story that you see in those uh, other films and documentaries. But when I say slightly different, it's the detail that makes all the, all the difference in the world. We call upon revolutionary movements everywhere to focus the attention of the world on the Palestinian people's struggle. Welcome to Entebbe, Uganda. There are 239 hostages at Entebbe. 83 are Israeli. The Germans separated the Jews. We have to act. There could be no negotiations with terrorists. You want to invade Uganda, Shimon? We give it back to them when we leave. Your version of events in Entebbe is a little different to the story presented by the current Israeli administration, specifically Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who actually lost his brother in the rescue mission. Are you worried about the reception the film might get by people who were there at the time? Uh, no, actually, in particular, I'm not concerned by the reception of the people who were there at the time. And Benjamin Netanyahu wasn't there at the time we did interviews with people who were there. So, um, for instance, when I was shooting the raid, the last five minutes of my movie, I had next to me Amir Offer, who was the first soldier who broke into the terminal. And, uh, and he had next to him the second soldier who broke into the ter terminal and who was the man who killed Brigitte and Bose. And as I was setting up the positions of the actors, measuring with tapes and so on, uh, I was doing it with them. And I believe that every single soldier that uh, entered that plane, not only Ioni, did something brave, took a gigantic risk. And uh, I just don't see why all this fuss about uh, what exactly happened to Ioni and what is it that makes him a hero or not. This is a very uh, peculiar Israeli thing. And my movie is not really about that. The Israeli authorities who had to deal with that hostage crisis at the time were Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Defense Minister Shimon Peres. And we see two conflicting uh, ideologies there, one perhaps more in favor of negotiation, diplomacy, and the other uh, a military intervention. How clear-cut did you see that choice as being and how many options do you think they had? Um, well, for starters, Shimon Peres and Yitzhak Rabin had just come out of a uh, a very tough election in which they were running against each other. They never liked each other on a personal level. And uh, Rabin won by a very narrow margin, but he had to accept Paris as defense minister in order to have a cabinet and a government. And uh, when Debbie happened, if something goes wrong, uh, it's the responsibility of the prime minister, not of the defense minister. And the standard uh, position in Israel is not to negotiate. Whenever you negotiate uh, with terrorists or with Palestinians, even if you're not talking about terrorism, 
uh, you lose political uh, clout, you lose um, standing. And so there was this political dilemma or dynamic going on. In this environment, there is a lot of fear in both populations because there's hijacks, there's bombings, there's uh, wars. And, uh, and so it's very easy for right-wing politicians to prey on fear and to get elected by saying, I am going to be the one who will protect you against the enemy. Uh, and as soon as you frame things in terms of me protecting you against the enemy, it's very hard to backpedal into negotiations. In your film, there's a line of dialogue where a character says, if we're not careful, Israelis will become a prisoner in their own country. That's quite a strong sentiment. Do you agree with it? Well, a line in a movie is, um, reflects the, not the opinion of a filmmaker, it reflects the, where the character is coming from. This is a, a Isaac Rabin line in the film. At that specific moment in time, Isaac Rabin was uh, campaigning as a politician to reduce the Israeli military budget. Um, he wanted more money to education, he wanted more money to culture. So he was pressing the idea that we can't totally militarize our country. Um, do I believe that a complete militarized country uh, will make its own citizens prisoners. Uh, right now, I think uh, the Palestinians are the prisoners at Gaza, no? Seven Days in Entebbe uses news archive footage, which is uh, edited into the drama. That's something that you often do. You have a background in documentary filmmaking, specifically with the Brazilian film Bus 174. For you, is fact always more compelling than fiction on the screen? When you make a movie about reality or when you make a documentary, you, um, you have two dimensions you have to take into account. You have one dimension that is uh, epistemological, it has to do with the relationship between uh, what the story is stating and the f historical facts. And then you have a, a, a dimension that uh, is from the, the, the dramaturgy. How do I structure an interesting film? Do I make this a thriller? Do I do flashbacks? In, in the real world, there are no flashbacks. So the epistemological dimension constrains the dramatic dimension in the sense that I cannot make up stuff that totally alters reality. I can make up some stuff because, for instance, I don't know what the terrorists spoke to each other, but I have scenes that say that, so obviously that's fictionalized. Other things are precisely, or I try to make them precise as they happen. Now, even the, given the constraints of, uh, of reality, I still have room to use cinematic art. Uh, I can use music, I can edit with a fast pace or a slow pace, I can have a wide camera or a short camera, and all those choices are still there. Now, one factual adaptation that you've received a lot of praise for is the Netflix series Narcos, which uh, recounts the story of the, how Pablo Escobar became the most wanted drug baron in the world. This series takes its time to take, tell a complex story. It's into its fourth season now. How do you think the format, uh, the series format, affects the way you work as writers, producers, directors? On Narcos, from the top, I wanted to have a first um, person account that uh, people outside of Colombia would be able to follow and understand. So I have a foreigner, an American DEA office, uh, that gets to Colombia and he knows nothing about it. A true person, Murphy, which was a consultant in the series, who we talked about his own experience there. And uh, he would take us through the journey of trying to uh, capture and kill Pablo Escobar. And uh, there is a way in for the audience through the eyes of Murphy. Uh, on the other hand, we wanted also to be authentic with Colombia, so we filmed in Colombia. We filmed in, in locations, we filmed in Medellin, we filmed in, in uh, Bogota. We were true to where things happened. And, uh, and we had the, in a poor drug, the, the Colombian characters uh, speak their own language. Uh, so it's, it became a bilingual series. I think it was the very first very big television that is bilingual. Um, and that was a choice that we made. Señores, yo soy Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria. Haciendo negocios, así que pues fresco. Ustedes eligen plata o plomo. 
You've got another series coming up with Netflix, The Mechanism, which goes into the huge political corruption scandal which is going on right now in Brazil. Were you worried about ruffling a few feathers at home since that operation's still ongoing? No. <laughs> I can make this answer very short, not worried at all. So what were the challenges in filming something that is currently evolving and is also politically very sensitive? You know, this started a while back, and uh, we started our series 10 years ago uh, in the inception of this investigation, actually an investigation that was uh, politically uh, shut down, and that came back later, three years ago, four. And uh, so we are telling the past of this ongoing event. We are looking at, um, we also have a book, very well researched by a journalist uh, from Brazil, Vladimir Neto, and uh, our narr narrative is based on that research that was done by Vladimir. So I don't feel pressure by politicians or anything. I just, um, I just focus on trying to, uh, again, make something that is uh, close to what happened in Brazil and also uh, uh, structuring the dramatic uh, dimension of the show in a way that's entertaining. It's the first time that we have uh, important politicians who were proven to be corrupt being punished in the country. Some of them are in jail, like the former governor of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And uh, as a Brazilian who have done movies about slums and, ve and seen very poor people be incredibly mistreated by justice and by the police, I'm happy that the politicians are getting their share. José Padilla, thank you for joining us. Thank you. In the beginning, I couldn't make out the whole disease. We saw one symptom. Roberto Abraham.